Six-year-old Kayla Woods and her brother Aaron were playing in front of their home in Los Angeles as a vehicle with three known drug traffickers was being pursued by Detective Jamie McBride, a 30-year veteran with the Los Angeles Police Department. The suspect vehicle struck Kayla on a street corner. They uh, hit a block wall, and uh, unfortunately there was a little girl uh, named Kayla, who was uh, just turned six 10 days earlier, was standing on that street corner with her four-year-old brother and she was pinned between the, uh, the car and the block wall, and she died instantly at the location. Kayla's family was destroyed. Her parents ultimately split up and left Los Angeles. Kayla's father said her death during the pursuit of criminals cannot be blamed on police. They were doing what they had to do, he was quoted. They could just let everyone go, and then no one would get caught. You can't fault police for what they did. You know, I have a lot of uh, second guessing. You know, if I would have done things a little differently, would she still be alive? LAPD Detective Jamie McBride has become a leading voice describing how bad crime has gotten today in Los Angeles, recently giving us a tour of some of the most dangerous neighborhoods in Los Angeles. They are also some of the most dangerous in the United States. It's 10 times worse than when I used to work here in the 90s. McBride carries a concealed firearm inside his jacket. I don't think it's that dangerous for me because I carry a firearm, but maybe for you, it might be a little dangerous, uh, especially when the sun goes down. The Los Angeles Police Department is reporting the highest number of homicides around the city in the last 15 years. In 2021, nearly 400 people were murdered in and around Los Angeles. Many of them were gang members though many victims have been residents murdered during robberies. The LAPD reporting that nearly 1,500 people were shot in 2021. For some perspective as to how dangerous Los Angeles has become, according to a recent national study determining the 10 most dangerous neighborhoods in the US, seven of them are in California, four of them here in Los Angeles. Many city leaders in Los Angeles have said the increase in crime here is not as bad as it seems. Refuting that, however, is Detective McBride, a high-ranking director with the police union here that represents nearly 10,000 LAPD cops. McBride cites surveillance camera videos surfacing of armed robberies like this one going down in broad daylight in LA's popular shopping district on Melrose. We had a recent incident where somebody was shopping on Melrose. They were followed home 50 miles to get back to their residence, and they were held up in their driveway by some armed suspects. That's how wild it is. And when I hear these people come on and, and they say, oh, it's not that bad, um, I'm telling you, 31 years experience, it's bad. <laughs> How much? McBride shocked many city leaders recently when he publicly warned tourists from around the world not to come to Los Angeles. We can't keep you safe here in Los Angeles. It's that scary and, and, and that we have to tell people, don't come here. McBride says Chinatown in downtown Los Angeles is one of the most dangerous neighborhoods. Chinese American merchants here routinely robbed, he says, by criminals walking here from LA's notorious Skid Row that he describes as an open crime zone inhabited by LA gang members. What you got here is you got tents everywhere. And what happened was the city council years ago decided um, that police officers can't just go into people's tents now because it's a violation of their privacy, so we have to get search warrants. 
So the, it didn't take long for the gang members to set up shop here in Skid Row. And what they do is they set up tents and they sell uh, their drugs out of here. You know, a lot of people think when they come to Los Angeles, they stay out of certain areas, they're gonna be safe, like Skid Row and downtown or, or uh, the parts in, in South Los Angeles where there's a lot of gang violence. That's, that's not the case anymore. Um, there's violence occurring all across Los Angeles. You hit Chinatown, uh, we have so many robberies in Chinatown right now. Hollywood, which you have a lot of uh, people coming to vacation or visit. Um, all kinds of violence going on. We have murders, people being shot. I think we have over 1,200 people shot last year alone. For some context in terms of crime, Los Angeles is not the only major city in the U.S. with an increase in homicides and gun violence. Cities across the nation have reportedly seen a rise in murders and violent crimes since the beginning of the coronavirus. According to FBI crime statistics, nearly 20,000 people were murdered in the U.S. in 2021, the highest number in 25 years. L.A. County District Attorney George Gascon, the top local prosecutor of criminals in the country, blames much of L.A.'s violence on the increased number of guns discovered on the streets here. No surprise, he says, considering the United States is said to have more than 400 million firearms circulating around the country. Police confiscated nearly 9,000 firearms in Los Angeles in 2021. Nearly 2,000 of those were what are known as ghost guns and don't have serial numbers, making it impossible to trace them. There is no question that we had an increase in homicides and violence in the last two years. Gascon also attributes many crimes in Los Angeles to what he calls a mental health crisis here and across the United States. You know, half of the people in our jail right now are mentally ill, many severely mentally ill. However, Gascon's critics blame his remaking of the criminal justice system going easier on criminals, giving them a second chance for an increase in crime. For example, upon his election as L.A. County's district attorney, he stopped requiring criminal suspects in nonviolent crimes to pay cash bail to get out of jail, effectively releasing them until their cases are heard in court. Additionally, he refuses to impose the death penalty in murder cases. He refuses to charge juveniles as adults. And he refuses to prosecute most nonviolent crimes, particularly drug-related offenses. In exchange, in many cases, he offers offenders social and educational programs to give them a chance to change their lives for the better, to stop committing crimes. Gascon says it was the 1991 LAPD police beating of Rodney King after a high-speed chase in which King was intoxicated that changed his view of law enforcement and how to treat people. At the time, Gascon himself was a Los Angeles police officer. The Rodney King incident for me was one of those moments, very graphic, excessive use of force. Riots exploded in L.A. when all four police officers involved were acquitted on excessive force charges. First of all, let me begin by saying I am not an abolitionist. I believe that some people need to be arrested. I think that some people need to be prosecuted and incarcerated. For me, the question is, this is like the equivalent in medicine to brain surgery, right? You should only use it when you absolutely know that you have to. And then it should be very measured because either too little or too much will have, you know, bad consequences. Arresting someone is a, is a very impactful thing in a person's life, especially the first few times. I understand once you get arrested over and over again, you know, like anything else, we as human beings, you know, adapt to our environment. That's your environment, but you know, it is a scary situation. For those of us that have actually seen a jail or a prison, uh, even from the other side, it is not a desirable place. It's a very dehumanizing experience. People come out of those places often in a much worse place than they were when they went in. And about 95% of the people that we put in jails and prisons are coming back out. 
So the question for me is, if you know that this is a dehumanizing experience, this is an experience that in many cases is going to cause an increase in the likelihood of people reoffending, and we know that by our recidivism rates being the highest in the industrialized world. So you understand all that harm that can cause, and the only time that somebody should be incarcerated is when they're dangerous and they need to be separated from the rest of us, or when we feel that there is a certain level of accountability. But the people that were getting arrested and incarcerated and criminalized very early on in their life were primarily poor kids, black kids, brown kids in our case. And the path that, that, that you know, having a criminal record so early on, reducing uh, your opportunities for employment and education. And it became very obvious to me that actually a lot of the problems that we were facing were often created by, by early policies and how we handle uh, early criminalization in many communities. And that also uh, played a major role in taking me to where I am today. It's unclear just what impact, if any, young offenders being offered alternative programs to prison is having on the overall landscape of crime here. Gascon's critics, among them veteran LA cops like Detective Jamie McBride, call Gascon's policies a liberal thinking, get out of jail free card that only leads to more crime. I don't care how many programs you give people, there's this evil in the world, and that evil needs to be incarcerated to protect everybody else. But George Gascon doesn't think that way. He thinks programs are, is, is the answer. It's terrible. You know, we. We take a lot of pride in protecting our citizens of Los, of Los Angeles. And when we arrest somebody and we put them in jail, and yet some of these guys are getting released faster than the officers can finish the reports, and that's a fact. Uh, we have victims calling the desk of, of stations saying, hey, the person assaulted me, they're, I just saw them walking in my neighborhood. And now they're scared because they realize nobody's staying in jail, so now they don't want to report crimes. When it comes to law enforcement, when there's a use of force, a use of force is not pretty. If you think about it, that's a violent act to gain compliance from a non-compliant uh, person. Um, and when that happens, it's judged over and over and replayed slowly and slowly and slowly. You gotta remember, a lot of these incidents occur in a matter of seconds, but yet people can dissect them over and over and over and, and rewind it and criticize every little thing. So it, it's a lot tougher to be a cop on the street than when I was a cop on the street because they're second guessed at every turn because of the body cameras that are out there now. You know, it's, it's only, you only see a certain aspect on a body camera. And if somebody takes a little snippet of it and put their own narrative to it, it changes the whole dynamics of what that, that footage is. And that's what we're seeing. We're seeing a lot of these um, footages being, being edited and then get a false narrative put on it. By the time the whole investigation comes out, the damage is done. Detective McBride says too few news reports talk about how many police officers are killed in the line of duty each year by repeat offenders. According to FBI statistics, 73 police officers were killed across the United States in 2021. What kills Detective McBride, he says, is the death of young Kayla Woods the day he pursued those criminals. Have you ever thought about what you'd say to Kayla, or do you have thoughts about her? To be honest with you, um... You know, I feel kind of guilty. I have two daughters and they keep going on with their lives and she's stuck at six years and 10 days old. So, it's sad. <laughs>